Hi, Tom. Thanks for uh, joining us uh, into our troubleshooting video. Oh, happy to be here. Happy to get people Great. set up and running on their voice system. Troubleshooting is uh, definitely a challenge with voice. <laughs> Exactly. It's a uh, often topic that uh, people are afraid are afraid to discuss, uh, or they don't know where to start with. Um, so um, uh, that's why we th we thought that you could be a good resources to uh, have this discussion. Um, so just to for our audience, your audience really know well. So uh, that probably is not going to be a surprise, but. Just for a quick intro, um, I would like to have a little bit of your background and to know how uh, your MSP started. And and after that, maybe you can tell us at which point uh, the phone and the voice services came into the life of your business. So I've been working in tech for over 20, about almost 25 years now, or 20, close enough. There's enough gray here. So I started in the 90s, uh, late 90s, and I landed my first bigger tech job in 1998. So I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, and even back then, when I, was, I, I became head of IT for a company, I was in charge of voice systems. Back then, it was uh, T1s and PRI lines and uh, all those things, which I, I imagine in some form still exist to some extent. They, they don't really go extinct. Um, I started my company in 2003 and did IT services. And still to this day, we focus a lot on the small business. So, you know, business of been in business coming up on 18 years here. So 18 years of focusing on a small business market. And you can't help but run into phone systems everywhere you go. People have them. They're not going away. The internet uh, became a different way to transport the phones. But as far as the phones ringing and you having to deal with them, uh, they've always been there. I've slowly got more and more into doing some of the phone system stuff. I'm still, I still feel like I'm not an expert in it, <laughs> but uh, we've definitely come quite a long ways. Uh, sometimes it's even why we've acquired clients because there's not a lot of knowledge every tech person has. They may know how networking works, but VoIP systems are a subset of the type of networking. And there, there's different nuances to fixing them, which is kind of what prompted me and you discussing before we came up with this idea for a video going, yeah, let's talk about this. Um, as far as us reselling voice, yeah, we've been, you know, quite a while ago, we discovered uh, VoIP MS. And then after we started, you know, really uh, talking about your service, we got a lot more into it. So it's been it's been a, a part of the stack that we offer as far as, you know, when we're putting in something for a client and putting in voice services, voice message would be something that we use. But yeah, other than that, we also, you know, probably somebody knows me from YouTube. We obviously uh, put out a lot of videos on YouTube and that's kind of what got us connected on this as well. Yeah, exactly. That's how uh, we, we encounter you, where, where we met you, in fact. So uh, long story short, uh, yeah. it's really it's really where we, we knew you. Uh, you were a complete yeah. stranger from us six months ago before you you were advocating for us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that ha you know, it's, it's backwards. People think everyone sponsors me. And it's kind of the backwards where if I like a product, I don't reach out to the product company. I just start making a video on it. And usually they reach out to me. Um, that's actually one. That's what uh, we do. I have a completely unrelated. Well, it's another tech related, but not related to voice interview I'm doing later. There's a company that's like, you have a really popular video on our product. And we want to talk to you because that is a good tutorial. So it, it's it's exactly the opposite of how people usually think it it happens. <laughs> just, yes, just, just yet, yesterday, uh, an Ontarian uh, guy I spoke with um, from Canada in Ontario, um, he, he was already one of our customers, but um, it, not really so much for business side. Uh, he's working for a big city in Ontario, I uh, can't name it, but anyway, um, he, he watched our video and after that he came back to us saying, oh, I didn't know that uh, what the mess could be suitable for for this kind of, of this type of needs, uh, and I, I listened. It, it came back to my mind when I listened to Tom's video. So I was like, even if we're like do not really pushing it, uh, it's really like a wheel and it comes back. So, uh, yeah, it, it's amazing how the video that you did in the past for uh, not for us but for yourself about us, uh, like. For us, it was really amazing to 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 see that, like the bubble yeah. around it. So yeah, it's it, it comes around full circle. So it's uh, it, it, it is exactly. fun. <laughs> um, speaking of advocate for stuff, 
um, I know you are an open source advocate. Uh, you yes. really like open source stuff. Do um, you think for you it's possible to do VoIP services through an open source solution? Yeah, you know, business? free free PBX, um, I don't try to declare myself an absolute expert at it, especially when people have really complicated setups. Um, sometimes we, you know, filled out to other people or contract them. But in general, I think free PBX, and it is what we use, is a really solid solution. Matter of fact, we have dealt with and run into many people have it tightly integrated into um, even more complexity. Oddly, even the customer that um, turned us on to you, so to speak, because we started, uh, we had a solution we had to get done rather quickly because um, we had to pour all the numbers over. Uh, there, it's all landed on a free PBX system. And all the problems you're experiencing was because Verizon bought XO Communications. And that just was, let's just say that didn't go well for anybody involved. And so we had to port about 40 phone lines really quickly. But one of the cool things about when you start looking at an open source solution like free PBX is the level of customization that client has been able to sense that, and it was over a year ago they did this, integrate into there. Now they're they're in-house doing it, but they started with an open source product and they're just integrating it into the workflows they have. So I think it's not just viable, it's, it's something where you can use it as a platform to integrate it into your line of business process, provided you want to spend some time developing it. But there's actually still a lot of add-ons, there's a lot of things you can do with free PBX uh, that it just makes it more flexible of a solution than even some of these proprietary ones. It also saves you all that mass confusion you get when you're trying to figure out licensing for some of the other products too. And some of these companies have truly done themselves a disservice in the phone business because trying to sort out how you get the license can be part of the confusion. They try to focus on being like, oh, we're channel partner only, so we're going to hide this. And each channel partner may not be as good as you think they are at actually providing the service. Where free PBX, you get it, you find someone to support it if you can't support it yourself. And it's kind of just a simpler model. So I, I really think open source has a big place to uh, play right in this market space. And what I think the other side that a lot of people don't know, so many large municipal projects, uh, especially right here in the state of Michigan where we are, that because because I know the people that work on them, they're all based on hysterics. And that includes... Um, a big amount of some of the emergency routing system. They just built it all on that because it's it. they could integrate it um, and they didn't have to deal with convoluted ways of bidding out phone systems. So they've actually got quite a few of these out there. There's, it's in use in more places than people realize, especially hospitality industry. Um, if you were to try to buy the one-to-one -one phone lines in the hospitality industry, it, it would start costing you too much to have like, you know, a hundred room hotel. Free PBX is often the integration in the back end of some of those uh, hospitality and uh, facility places where they don't need as many phone numbers, but they need a lot of phones to be able to contact a lot of other people because that's just, it, it's a unique use case. So yeah, I think open source is a huge, it's bigger than people realize in the phone system. It, I say huge, but it's also probably, it's just a couple of products. It's mostly free PBX and the steerix based systems that makes up yeah. the majority of it. Yeah, exactly. On the voice services in the PBX uh, environment, free PBX, uh, Asterix, Asterix, it's open source. They yeah. the, the main open source um, uh, voice service, voice, not services, but voice product. Uh, but uh, maybe are you familiar with uh, Microsoft? Uh, the the little I, soft phone? I haven't used um, that one. Most of the time we're either running into, you know, Asterix is the core project and free PBX is usually what sits on top of it. And because that's the free open source one, um, that is probably the most popular one we see. I don't see as many of the other ones, or it could be that people, I've never done videos on the other ones, so they don't request any of those uh, when they contact us for consulting. <laughs> but uh, Microsoft is a really light soft phone. Uh, okay. It's not really suitable for a mass deployment, I think, but for uh, SMB, for small businesses, uh, Microsoft could really be a good soft phone um, to be integrated with like off small offices or anybody that uh, uh, only need the uh, one seat uh, kind of environment. Yeah. Um, it, so there, there's actually a couple open source uh, soft phones out there that I didn't write them down. Mm -hmm. I haven't mess. Yeah, there's there's a there's a handful of them out there that run on Linux that are open source. Um, there, 
there's definitely a few different options. I didn't write them all down before this, so I didn't. I even I don't use them as often. Um, I'm use I'm odd on that part. Uh, I usually route the calls through my computer through some of the, you know where he's a free PBX. So we use actually the Sam the same Noma yeah. tool. So. Yeah. Maybe uh, if you uh, you are aware of a few uh, cell phones that running uh, on Linux, uh, you have to uh, speak about it on the Home Lab show. Yes, uh, it's, it's a, a good a idea. Well, you know, I think that's probably a good one to talk about because um, years ago I used a lot more of them. That's why I can't believe some of them have fallen out. I, I played with this in the early days because um, I thought it was so cool to be able to, when you could first get SIP over the internet, I mean, this was a long time ago. It was kind of like, oh, this is so cool. You could, we just buy, me and a few friends, we bought phone numbers in different cities because we thought it would be cool. <laughs> like, because you can. Because we can, but like, look, it is, I got, that was a long time ago, but it was, uh, it was that first, Hey, look, this is easier to do. You know, if you ever remember, uh, I think it was called dialpad.com that used to give you free phone numbers online through a web browser. It that's long, long gone. That's, it was, it, it was obviously great for uh, having fun online. And when you're young and it, it turned into prank calls all the time, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, right now, uh, right now we did like for, from my past uh, with the old telco, uh, where when a business is moving from a place to another, uh, if it's not in a good rate center because it's not worth its old pot lines, ma, sorry, I cannot move your phone lo- phone line from that area to this area because it's not in the same rate center. But with VoIP now services uh, like SMB. Uh, a phone number is really valuable because it's a it's a marketing piece. It's something like uh, it's shared across a, a lot of networks. Uh, I know it can be rebuilt, but um, like in the past, uh, using a phone like uh, just 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 not be able to move your phone from a place to another was a nightmare. So yeah, uh, yeah. Right now, with a, one of the good benefit of uh, VoIP is. You don't care in which the uh, ac- you, you sit ac- it, actually. So, yeah, it, it, if you um, spend a few minutes on YouTube, you can find a fun video that was recorded. I think around sixties or seventies that uh, AT and T put out, and it shows what an, what a cutover used to look like. And they call it a cutover because they literally would cut lines at one uh, exchange that would make them fall, fail over to the other exchange. It's kind of a cool video. And I, I shared it on Twitter a couple of times and I'm like, this is just neat because they literally physically mean cut wires, not move switches. It's uh, yeah. yeah, we've come a long way. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. But uh, this long way uh, comes with issue at some point, unfortunately, or not big issues, but um, structural issue that we have to uh, overcome whenever we have to come from uh, a legacy phone system to uh, a VoIP phone system uh, that it's either networking issues or uh, codec issues or uh, they, these a lot a lot of uh, a lot of trouble that needs uh, uh, to be uh, resolved before uh, it's working properly. Uh, in any cases, uh, it could be it, like switch on everything work fine and voila. Uh, we don't uh, nothing to do, uh, but sometimes <laughs> it's a little bit more trickier if you have a internet carrier that blocks your ports on your <laughs> yes <laughs> on your modem. If you have a, I don't know a, a, like a super fancy sonic wall switch or Fortinet uh, uh, switch uh, that 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 block your ports or block your there, there's so much uh, thing to troubleshoot. Um, and that's why we are here today to discuss about that. Yeah, let's shooting. dive into that. So, you know, I would actually, I was really thinking about the talking to my other techs and like, what is the number one thing that we run into? And I, I'm going to start off with the SIP ALG helper um, system that's not helpful. And what that is, is there is a helper application built into uh, a lot of different routers and firewalls, but specifically the one that's really uh, perplexing is what Comcast uses. Um, Comcast being one of the largest internet providers, but it's not just Comcast. It's anyone who uses the Aris series of cable modems. So cable is a popular way that you're going to get internet distributed to small businesses. Um, fiber's great, but it's not what you see all the time. Fiber's more in the corporate environment. It's not that it doesn't exist, but narrowing um, it back down to in that. Quebec, in Quebec here, we have a like old networks and and really 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 
large area. So cable network for us here in Quebec is like one of the main. Uh, yeah. And even, networks. yeah, even here, they're, they want to push fiber, but honestly, um, from a cost standpoint, even in the metropolis area of Detroit that we're in, uh, it's still mostly fed with cable. Now, it's not that the cable itself is the problem. It comes down to that Aris modem. That Aris makes a really popular cable modem, and they also kind of dumb it down when they sell it to any of the uh, cable providers. And what I mean by dumb it down is they kind of hide features, and they don't hide them in any way that um, makes sense because they leave SIP ALG on. I don't have exactly which bottles it is, but that's actually where the mystery comes in. If you like type in SIP ALG Aris, you'll find lots of forum posts that all end up with VoIP problems. And the real challenge is there's not a solution. So it works and it doesn't work the back and forth problems. You can end up with sometimes the one-way phone call where only one call works, but not the next, uh, where someone doesn't hear you on the other line, but they can, it's, you're not getting both ways of communication. Um, one of the interesting ones is when they have multiple lines behind one of these, only one phone ever works at a time. So when they try to uh, pick up the phone, it just, first person answer is great. If another call comes in, the phone rings, but when you pick up the call, just nobody's there. Uh, we've also seen it cause problems with trying to transfer. If the PBX is outside the office, like you, you're doing a host of PBX, when you try and transfer between phones, it just drops. And it very frequently has to deal with the SIP ALG not working properly. Then it seems like the solution would be to disable it, but that's where the puzzle comes in because they've hidden all the options. So it's enabled without any way to disable it. But if you call Comcast or many of the cable providers, they actually tell you, oh yeah, just go to this menu. But that menu doesn't exist because it doesn't exist in most models, but maybe certain models it does. Our solution is the same for whenever we run into cable modems is if you're letting whatever the ISP sold you, gave you, however the arrangement was, um, we replace it right away. That's one of the first things that solves the majority of problems and quirkiness is getting rid of whatever they did. One of the things I always remind people is, you know, why, why Aris? Why not Cisco? Why not some other company? And the reason is really simple. They, they go through, they're going to buy X amount of them. Let's say you're Comcast and you're going to buy one product. You're going to go for the cheapest product possible. So yeah. welcome to the cheapest product they could possibly deliver internet to your office with. And welcome to all the problems that may come with that inexpensive product. Um, so the one of the first steps is often getting rid of that or putting it in a bridge mode so another router can handle it. And what if uh, the internet provider don't let you change the modem because it, 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 they, you can change the, the router, but you cannot have a different modem. Uh, let's say right. they, they don't let you do that because whatever the reason, is, is, there, is there something uh, it's except deactivate, disable the, the CPLG, let's say uh, it's so far hidden that you just cannot, there's, is there other way or you just have to change your internet provider? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as we know, in many areas, probably the same in Canada as it is in the US, changing internet provider is not always an option. Um, but the majority of these do support what they refer to bridge mode. And what that does is it's going to hand off the IP routing functions over to whatever router you have. And once you can put another router and bridge it over there, now you're bypassing all of those weird quirky issues that SIP, um, the SIP ALG and all the helper applications that they may have. Um, it just bridging it solves those problems. Now, the other thing you get is at the same time, QoS is part of what uh, may be causing a problem. And there's often some type of rudimentary QoS on there, or if, if there is, it may not be tuned properly. Bridging solves that problem at the same time. So generally speaking, we bridge it, and that's how we get rid of it. I mean, you see, it's great if you can replace it, but for example, with Comcast right now, um, on any of their business lines, their new policy is you have to use their modem, but they do allow you in bridge mode. And they, they just change the rules on a few people. If some are lucky because if they replaced it before the real change, they're allowed to use their third party ones. But since the rule change, when they sell it, they only support theirs. And that's the only thing you can use. But at least they do offer bridge mode, which uh, brings the routing over to whatever dice you put in place in front of it. Okay, great. And are you considering this first issue or this first problem, common problem, uh, as the first thing you have to look? Uh, if Let's say you have to drop down a list uh, of 
what's the first five or I don't know, 10 steps oh, yeah. you have to, <laughs> of troubleshooting? Is it the first thing you will have to look at or, or what, I, what, what's, uh, I would actually it? say, I would actually say yes. And, and the reason for that is it takes out that big unknown of where that problem is because it, it, it can be random, especially we had one person that could make three phone calls. The fourth phone call would drop, but they would just say call drop. That's how the call comes in from a troubleshooting standpoint. Um, and right away, we started suggesting replacing, you know, the cable modem and putting in bridge mode. There was pushback when they seen the price. And we said, well, we won't go any further. So a lot of times we stop it there. But once they agreed later and said, ah, oh, this is really aggravating. And we called another people out who charged us a bunch of money and couldn't fix it. I'm like, yeah. And they left it in because they told, you know, the, the debate of different technical people with different opinions. Someone else told them that they didn't have to replace it, that I was wrong. But that person then wasn't able to solve it. So they came back to us. And all we did was the only troubleshooting we did. Once we dropped it in, that's it. Every problem, every phone worked. They didn't have any more dropped calls or anything like that. So that's always going to be the first step because it does clear up a lot of problems. But obviously, there's a lot more to voice than just so, so the first step. That's so it's not the only problem. We number one problem in the small business market. <laughs> so the first step to you would be in full control of your equipment. <laughs> yes, have control of the equipment. Because that, that can be another issue. Um, you know, if they have, they maybe they already have a bridge system. Um, let's you know, go there and it's a 40 net, it's it's a uh, sonic wall. If they don't have the password to that, there's our next problem right away because we need to know what settings are in there, what settings you know yeah. maybe need to be tuned. Is there a firmware update? Um, because there's actually if you go through the errata of a lot of different firewall companies, you'll see SIP on there kind of frequently for voice problems as one of the reasons for the firmware update. Because as the voice protocols evolve a little bit and things may change, um, they've got to make sure that the packets are being handled properly by each device. So we need to have control of the equipment or have access to it, I should say, in order to make sure it's up to date and is configured properly in order to allow voice to work. Okay, good. And what's next after, what's the next step uh, like like on site or uh, what's the diagnostic tools you will use to push? Let's say you replace that, it, it doesn't work. Uh, Probably you have to turn yourself to a network issue, internal network issue. Uh, yes. So I, I would say it, it could be this. It could be a provider uh, issue too. But uh, the, the most common uh, thing we see is uh, if you hook a phone directly to the provider and it's working, so probably there's something else. Uh, and how do you uh, troubleshoot a networking issue around void? Because it's not because you can open... Um, a Google tab browser that and your right. is working fine that the, the voice is going through uh, and what 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 would be uh, well what would be the the next step from there so the first some of the next steps when you're sorting out the network issue is long term ping test doing more than just like you know ping it and default as you three times in Windows or four times in Windows um, we'll set up a little bit longer of a ping test there's actually tools out there like smoke ping you can use and you want to start seeing if it's dropping packets first is it dropping packets on the local network if the answer is no then you move on to let's ping the voice server itself can we route to that voice server does it have high latency are there a series of drops? Because you want to sort out, you know, to make sure that the packets are all making it round trip. Because you'll find you that, uh, well, capture will get to. Um, the first thing is you'll see a lot of drops. It, the thing that people say, well, the internet works fine. I didn't notice it. Especially if you are just using it to do online, whatever, shopping, Facebook, social media, listening to uh, Spotify or listening or watching a YouTube video. Um, packets get dropped all the time. And the way that packets are delivered, it just retransmits them. And if you ever watch the YouTube line when you're watching, it's buffering ahead. So no problem is getting there. So you can actually have a network with a latency problem or that's having a bunch of loss, but because the protocols are not two-way, they're not real time, no problem. Now you see if you have a lot of packet loss, uh, if you're using Zoom or something like that, you're gonna, you'll, you'll notice it because real time interaction, but that's usually not what at the at, well, it was a lot more for 2020, but most of the time they're not doing as much real time uh, Zoom and things like that. So they may not know that there's packet loss. So we kind of have to sort out if there's any packet loss. Now, if the packet loss is not there and the ping times are good and there's not a latency problem, that's when we move on to that next step of 
okay, we might have to capture these packets to try and figure out what's going on. And that's where I really hope they have an advanced firewall that lets me do all the packet capture so I can do it remotely. I don't want to have to go there on site unless I have to and, and uh, put in a port span so I can you know gather all the data, but that might be something that has to be done. Because we can capture AdWord MS support, uh, we can capture from Ornet or two years, but after yeah. that, there's another branch uh, where it's uh, from the infrastructure to or uh, or data centers. So there's like a two two yeah. sides. Uh, yeah, two sides to it. In in one of the other simple tests too, if, if they're setting it up where they have, let's say, a free PBX on site. Well, with the free PBX on site, and even troubleshooting, we've done setting things up for ourselves and test scenarios. You know, can calls work within the office? Set up several calls inside the office. Do they all work? Do they all connect from phone to phone? Because that means it's doing, you know, intra phone calls and they're not leaving. Because we've had problems where we found that problem with a customer we took over recently. They couldn't even make calls internally. And they were trying to troubleshoot the external. I'm like, well, if your internal network isn't working, we we have to solve this. It'll probably solve the yes. external yeah. part. <laughs> yeah, and if you have a your that either on site or or cloud PBX, a hosted PBX, if you put the the, the free PBX on an instance out there, yeah, um, it, it's it's still connecting within the, the same PBX. So even yep. at this point, yet yeah, it's not it, it has nothing to do. With yet with the board provider yet. <laughs> yeah, not yet. So once we start, you know, make sure that works, then that next step is looking at the logs is in detail before you even do the packet capture. A lot of times the logs are very revealing of what's going on, especially if you see it making a connection and then dropping. And if you read through, you'll, and, and the same thing on the VoIP MS side, we can see, is it registering? Is it staying registered? Uh, we had found, and I believe the documentation has now been updated, um, that, oh, I can't remember the name of the protocol, one of the NAT favorable protocols had a timer in it. So there was a, a timing alignment of how long it would stay registered. And um, it, ah, it's, it's kind of a Will's one-off esoteric. It got deep in a forum post, but the phones would only work for four hours at a time. And then there would be a time they didn't work. All it was is an extra timing setting that had to be put. So it keeps the uh, state tables from dying. So those sometimes can be really tricky. Uh, this is where having any advanced firewall that offers me being able to look at the actual state tables and make sure that the states are staying up and not dropping. Because this is where you can get into a little bit of confusion because if you have the, the PBX or the phone, either one, behind a NAT system, and those states have to stay alive back and forth. And NAT is the better way to do this now. And it's finally, used to you had to open up all the ports. Hopefully you don't have to, you guys completely at VoIP MS support all the proper NAT that works. And yeah, um, yeah. yeah, that's, that's important because if you don't have NAT, you have to have the voice system be able to talk through your firewall and initiate the session with NAT. The session has to be initiated from behind the NAT. That means though, it has to keep the state tables alive from behind the system through and into that other server. So being able to look to see if they're dropping or they're what they refer to as going stale and just not being able uh, to go and refresh, that's how we were able to actually troubleshoot that weird, if someone configured something strange, they were using VoIP MS, but they didn't follow the, the instructions VoIP MS has are correct. They had their own idea of how they should do it. And that's, yeah, yeah that's, uh, so when we looked at it, we're like, why is that so different? And it just turns out there there is more than one way you guys support several different protocols. And when they had done it, they had a timer that was supposed to be put into it, basically that says, send a pulse out. Now, the good, the, what made this harder to troubleshoot, and this is one of the things you have to watch for, every time a phone call came in, a new pulse would be sent out to keep the state table alive. So it was only during numerous hours of no phone calls that the state tables would drop. And then when a new call comes in, your system didn't have a connection anymore to the internal system to actually make the phone ring. They can always make calls out, which is what also, hey, you know, they get the phone call from some external client, your phones are down. They would try and call the call themselves via cell phone, it'd be down. But if they called out from their phone, the connections would all come back up and it'd work again. So let's just say this was not a fun one to troubleshoot, but it's 
but watching the state tables and going for so many hours and keeping an eye on it, that's what actually allowed us to see, ah, for some reason, a pulse quits sending and when it gets renewed. There, there's a lot of little nuance to it um, that you have to watch at uh, to make sure that's working. And either the, the state stable uh, uh, the, the, or tracing um, are often like a needle in a haystack. Uh, just to be really uh, uh, precise about that, is there a yes. trick for you to like pinpoint a, a problem? Uh, probably like a simple search with with a specific um, a specific uh, usually. Expression. Yeah, uh, what we're going to do is first the, the for Wireshark being the tool of choice, um, you'll go through and build a rule for you know grab the packet capture and if you have a nice firewall, hopefully it will filter for you. Uh, for example, PF Sense has the ability to narrow down what IPs you want to capture. That way, you're not capturing all the network traffic. I'm only capturing specifically network traffic related to the voice IP addresses. Next, IP after that, you're going to like ports or between specific ports or yeah we you can name specific ports usually we just filter by ip address because honestly the only traffic that the you know free pbx machine should be doing is talking to voip ms using sip traffic so we can and narrow it down to that ip address yeah. yeah we just can narrow it down by ip address then from there um there's a couple tools built into Wireshark that lets you actually trace a SIP call. It's actually a filter built in so you can say uh follow follow this stream and apply the SIP rules to it and it can trace it out for you. Matter of fact, I have a video where I demo that you can replay a phone call from packet capture, which is kind of cool too, because um, not everybody realizes that the native default way the majority of phone calls are transported is in an unencrypted form. That's pretty common. Therefore, the handshake is where the password is hashed, but the actual transport of data is not. That's how you can uh, pull out some of the voice data and things like that and use some of the tools within Wireshark to kind of analyze that. Or even in the case, I did, in, as I demonstrated in my video, you can just play back the phone call <laughs> and listen for it and kind of listen for, you know, dropouts and uh, the, the noticeable latency issues that you may run into with that. In this case, uh, that brings me uh, probably uh, to uh, one of the pointed question, if I can say. Um, I'm following you uh, on social platform, and I often see you um, speaking about cyber securities. Yeah. Um, and I know security is really it's something matters. So, and it, it as you just said, uh, can be in a hurt of troubleshooting uh, VoIP services. So. First, what is the concern, like you just mentioned, uh, how uh, we have to make sure that uh, this, the, how we can make sure these kind of things not happening, uh, probably with proper networks, but, uh, and two, um, what is the best security practice for you in, in VoIP specifically? I would, yeah. I would narrow it so, <laughs> um, ideally, one of the problems is the SIP protocol is old, so it does not use the strongest hash, but the solution workaround mitigation are probably best word. Um, using really long, complicated passwords because we know we can brute force them to an extent when you use a weaker hash for SIP. So that's one of the reasons in free PBX when it generates the uh, passwords for SIP, like even when it's connecting to local phones, it uses a I don't know if it's 20 random characters. Um, it generates really long passwords. So that's at least one of the good solid practices you can have. Uh, boy, you could, and this is to get not too far off topic, but you can really do a lot with free PBX, making sure it's locked down because uh, you don't want too many people going and poking around admin menus in uh, free PBX. Uh, it'll be a little bit off topic, but that's obviously another security issue is making sure you've configured it so people can't just get into your voicemail box. Please have your voicemail box with something longer than a one, two, three, four password. Maybe it's not someone's like, but all you would get is my voicemails. Maybe, but if you have some of those automated systems that will call for a password reset and things like that, um, this was something people would do. They would figure out someone's voicemail password and then they could get 
a reset sent to their main number and listen to the recording and play it back. It's one of those edge cases. But if you're thinking about security, you're thinking about small business and you think about impersonating or if someone gets in your phone system and redirects calls. Uh, this is literally, we, we dealt with this with a hacked phone system with a client. That's why they contact us. They're like, our calls are going everywhere. And uh, someone got into their phone system and was impersonating them and calling out as their system. And they were actually calling, they had set up external routes <laughs> and were dialing in. So uh, making sure that your PBX system is locked down with good passwords is a, a critical piece to it. You know, And of course you guys have 2FA on your end and if there's no reason not to enable that. So yeah, for um, the registration side of a uh, SIP account, yes, uh, we have a couple of uh, security features to make yep. sure um, you, or you can even, um, authenticate it by uh, IP address and password yes. instead of SIP username and password. So, and, but mostly, uh, you have to have a couple of components to make, to uh, arrive to hack a PBX with, uh, or yeah. credential. So there's, I think uh, four or five, uh, different, different, uh, item that needs to match to make sure that, uh, it, it can go through. So I think the security on our side is pretty strong. Um, what do you think about call encryption? I, I like call encryption. It's, I wish it was more widely supported. Um, unfortunately, I mean, modern systems absolutely support it. And if I, everyone would upgrade to a modern system, I'm, I'm excited because that would be wonderful. But, um, I, I work in the real world where we run into systems that, are less than modern and getting people to always update them. But I'm all for call encryption. I'm, it's something I wish everyone supported. Um, I think anything modern really does support it, but I know it, it can be a little bit more challenged. Now, the other, the other problem you run into is uh, there's not a lot of free PBX technicians out there. And a lot of them are older, much older than me, and they've always done it this way. And um, some of them are causing some of the problem. <laughs> yeah. And um, because we were speaking about troubleshooting, uh, what, how do you, is there a difference between troubleshooting uh, encrypted call uh, and oh, yes. encrypted system versus non-encrypted? And yes. what's the difference? Anytime there's encrypted, I can't visibly look into some of the handshakes. I can't reverse engineer them as easy. Um, so that is, unfortunately, I, I have myself been guilty of this. When I'm having a problem, I may drop down to a different protocol that's not encrypted so I can troubleshoot the problem. And then I'll go back later and encrypt it and change it up there. I just have to, sometimes it's one of those things that I don't want to turn it off, but I got to get around sometimes wh why I'm having a problem I'm having. It's not too often. It's a, that's a more of a rare thing, um, but it's worth mentioning. It's like, it, it's one of those options out there. And we just tell people we can change the passwords later that we sent because in case someone sniffed these weaker hashes and things like that, not a big deal. First, we need to establish why don't these calls are out? Why doesn't the system register? Um, get like a baseline working and then move over to an encrypted system. Definitely um, better and more ideal if you're doing everything encrypted, but it's also having to make sure you you have a modern system. That's, it, it, we run into a lot of uh, kind of one-off systems out there by different companies that they have places that drop SIP information in, but it's limited on what protocols matter of fact even the phones um a lot of the older phones out there i mean the, the people it's hard to tell them hey buy 20 new handsets because these ones don't have anything other than the most basic of protocols in them <laughs> but sometimes uh, the price win you know yeah yeah they I, you, you tell them i mean it's only a couple hundred dollars a handset they're like but we need 20 of them and then they go i, I don't know if i want to buy it <laughs> yeah unfortunately but yeah yeah. It's uh, often, uh, it often uh, money talks. Uh, yeah, money talks. Say. In the end, that's why I said I live in a real world where um, I, I, not everyone has an unlimited budget. They, they have a lot of things that they're being told to upgrade, not just their phones. So the phones are like, well, maybe someone will sniff our phone calls and listen on the line. But it seems like maybe fixing this other thing over here is more critical to our business. So those, those decisions are being weighed all the time every day. <laughs> totally true. Yeah. Apart from that, you have uh, other, maybe other idea how we can approach uh, troubleshooting either uh, as an IT guy or even a uh, own uh, yeah. home technician. I think the last one to mention is going to be QoS. This is often misunderstood, and the QoS is not just 
limiting an amount of bandwidth. It's not quite as simple as that. You have to get the packets to arrive at their destination in a proper orderly format. And it's the quantity of packets more so than it is bandwidth. Bandwidth was the early days problem. Um, it's still a problem in some places, but overall bandwidth has gotten much bigger. It's yeah, phone calls take up so little bandwidth. It's usually not a bandwidth problem unless you're downloading something that's saturating all of it. But or quality of service. In cottage, you're in a cottage house, like a, yeah. in the woods, where <laughs> like satellite uh, internet connection, and even then, that's then it's not going to be your problem. It's going to be the latency and jitter. So, uh, but yeah, QoS uh, and and apart from you, you, you said it, it's not a bandwidth problem, but everybody sees. QoS like a reserve of bandwidth for a specific item in your network. Uh, you, after that, you said the package, you have to make sure the package is going through. Uh, and if you can um, conceptualize a little bit this, how would you say you, you say that? So it, it's basically if, if you have order versus chaos. So the packets generally in your own network, let's say you're, you know, your most modern networks are connected at, let's say one gig connections. So the packets get very fast from wherever they are in your office within a mil milliseconds later, they're all lined up at the firewall. The firewall, a modern advanced one with proper uh, like drop tail is one of them. There's a couple different methodologies and these are just mathematical algorithms that look at the packets and prioritization sometimes does play into this. We want to make sure that they're going to go in the same order. They should be aligned with, as so to speak, like the framing of how the stack works. Um, and you want these to be able to go through in an orderly format. That's the best way I can describe it. And that may include some prioritization and some throttling. The person with the YouTube video that they're watching, that can probably be cut back a little bit. You know, we don't need all of that bandwidth. Uh, we've had some people who are bandwidth restricted. You know, everyone wants to listen to music in our office. Well, next thing you know, you have an office with 50 people all listening to some random online streaming. Well, that can choke up your bandwidth a little bit. Not in the bandwidth it uses is because everything wants to buffer. It's like, hey, can I send you this whole song or this whole video? Hey, looks like there's enough bandwidth to do it. Well, that may come at the expense of the person on the phone call making the sale and it'll kind of go back and forth between them and that may not be ideal. So this is where a prioritization comes in where the quality of service system will look at it, look at your RTP, look at your packet streams or like in a case that we have, we prioritize specifically the IP address landing on VoIP MS. So we have statically set in our QoS system, the IP addresses that are the VoIP MS servers that we have attached and we do this for our clients as well. And then we say, those go first. And once those packets have left the queue, go ahead and put back in the queue anything else is essentially what it's doing. That way they're coming in and same thing, it's an inbound outbound route. So same with there's a lot of packets coming in, you route those voice ones first through the QoS system. And then all the Spotify's and YouTube's and streaming music services, they can come through as long as those voice packets have been processed and where they need to go. And keeping like a reserve so all that happens is where you get like the jitter problems or buffer bloat. And those are two things you can kind of look to kind of get an understanding of the buffer bloat problem. Matter of fact, this is a common reason people end up with slower internet. They buy a 500 gig connection and they only can get 300 and they're like, why do I only get 300 all the time? I'm like buffer bloat. If, if you switch out the firewall, it's not that the firewall can't handle the speed, but the firewall is not prioritizing the packets in an orderly fashion in order to get them through. So these are important factors you really have to uh, work on. Matter of fact, I learned if you're in Australia, I was doing some consulting with someone in Australia, the ISPs in Australia, um, they have a weird packet routing uh, strategy that's absolutely terrible. If you buy a full connection, but you saturate that full connection, they throttle it by choosing to drop packets, not do QoS. And when a packet gets dropped, it has to be retransmitted. So you'll watch your internet speed up downloading something. When it hits the limit, you actually end up losing so many packets. It sends so many retransmits, you get a much slower limit. So they actually started putting basically where you never consume more than 90% of your bandwidth. Um, so you don't hit those limits and that can actually smooth it out. And my understanding is this occasionally happens in the uh, US ISP market as well. Some of the smaller providers may just decide, you know what, you hit this much bandwidth and then we drop as opposed to throttle. And if they use that strategy, you have to set your QoS to be some percentage less than the maximum. 
these are those little uh, things that someone says, well, it doesn't make sense. I'm only setting it to be like 85% of my full connection. I'm like, yeah, but you'll actually end up with a better experience. And by the way, your phones will work too. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so in other words, uh, left the chaos behind and have the, or the, the phone service in order. So yeah, if, if you want to, yeah, it's one of those things like from a from a human standpoint, if you want to see chaos, as soon as you look at some intersections, traffic intersections, and the light goes out, it's like somehow all these people could flow in the traffic and then a few lights go out and it's chaos. Everyone just comes to a stop. That's that's basically what it looks like stop, from a stop, stop, stop. Yeah, yeah yep. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's a it's a really good uh, prioritization of the traffic. I think it's really uh, um underrated uh <laughs> yeah, I would say. Uh, I, I, yeah. I heard a lot about that, uh, and often when I'm I'm I, I'm not a tech, but I speak uh, with with customers uh, on technical calls, and uh, they don't they they rarely mention that. And whenever we mention the prioritization of the traffic, it's like if it's all of a sudden it's a, it's a new concept. If it's like, a, but it's been out there since uh, a while now, but. Yeah, it, it's an yeah. Concept, it's 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 always interesting to see. I mean, um, where my building is, there's a light down the street that they were working on for a while, and the traffic, the same amount of cars pass every day. But when that light's being worked on and it went out, the traffic backs up way past my building. You can't get out of my own parking lot. Everything goes to chaos, um, and that's really what that traffic management does. It everything is queued up, but you want it to go out in an orderly fashion because. There are choke points in networks. Like I said, your network's one gig, but maybe your internet provider is half a gig. That means we have to organize how we utilize that bandwidth. And part of that utilization is making sure things go in the proper order and get priority, including voice. Because like I said, you can lose a few packets on a stream for something that buffers ahead. But voice is very sensitive to this because it's real time okay. handoff and yeah. you'll end up with this weird latency where you'll hear choppiness in the voice and you'll, it, it's one of those, yeah, uh, definitely a, a big issue that comes into there is uh, dealing with the QoS. So there's some of the harder issues to solve unless you have a, a modern firewall that has proper quality of service in it. And uh, who do you call when you need to set it up? Oh yeah, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is and it, doing doing the network engineering there's you know is a big part of what we do here at lawrence systems um and I, we do have another focus on some of the voice because the voice networks are because they're a real-time network they line up with streaming services they're kind of a niche into themselves understanding the protocols and the way things are done and this just comes to that you know voice legacy like we mentioned earlier in the video here of how you converted so much voice protocols and embedded them as opposed to reinvented them inside of TCP. And once we established some of them, they haven't been revisited in a while. <laughs> so, um, so those protocols are uh, old, old RFC standards that everyone follows. And as I said, this old, ain't broke, don't fix it. So there's not really a push yeah. to swap out this old exactly. department. <laughs> that was our. That was our. That what I was thinking. I was like, yeah, but if, if it works, why change it? But uh, sometimes maybe have a more bandwidth efficient package. Uh, but we see a uh, uh, newer codec arrive in the market now, uh, or 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 revisited codec that that can help uh, to reduce the bandwidth and and improve the the audio quality. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's not like forever standing at some like an aging forever uh, where I've seen there's new stuff um, arrive from time to time, but it's really uh, like, like you said, it's, it's stuck in the past or, or almost. And uh, yeah, but it works. So, uh, well, I mean, I, I don't miss, uh, did you ever, how long you've been working on phones? Uh, almost 15 years. Okay. So you, you dealt with some of the ground loop start systems where you had to ground short them and things like that on current. I worked on some of the commercial for, uh, PRI lines and PBX and POTS lines where we had to deal I, with. Yeah. Oh, I did install Nortel uh, BIX uh, and, and PBX uh, yep. in, in, in the first, uh, first years of my career in telecom. <laughs> And uh, one of the thing was it, yeah, it's low voltage, uh, but you, you, we uh, we had to ground the, some some part of the wire to make sure that uh, it's it's out of uh, the electricity electricity yeah. loop. And uh, yeah, but it's uh, it's it's interesting seeing how all that works. I I did uh, Nortel Meridian. That was what I used to have to administer. The it's funny. There's we have one client 
that still has a few of that left because it runs part of their medical facility. And I'm like, I seen it. And he's like, you're going to get a kick out of this. And he took me down to the room. <laughs> they are a VoIP on the new end, but the one section of the building, they're like, no one wants to replace it because it works. We're waiting for it to fall apart because the thing is like 30, well, it's got to be more than 30. They put it in the 90s and it still works. Um, but uh, people don't like changing out those old phone systems. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with these phone, uh, the guy will retire before the phone die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you can't find anyone to service it. They have all the command. They have a command book uh, sitting next to it. A little three ring binder with yellow. The paper is yellow now. It's so old. Um, I was looking through. I'm like, oh, I remember typing those commands. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did. I did. I uh, did not uh, do a lot of this, but uh, I, I was the the freshman uh, helping the technician uh, finding the common uh, uh, for for them. And uh, okay, now we have to input uh, the name of this person uh, and so on. So yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot to learn. I. I I encourage people to dive into things like free PBX, uh, set up a VoIP MS account, start playing with it and start learning the complexities. There's definitely, there's a demand in the market um, for more people to be into phone engineering for sure. So if you, it's, it's one of those, everyone talks about cybersecurity being a really popular one. I tell you, phone systems ain't, they're not going away anytime soon. So <laughs> no, no. Uh, in fact, we, we have lived um, with a pandemic. We have lived, uh, lived one, probably one of the, were best uh, two last year approach uh, in phone in phone system. A lot of um, uh, either work from home or even just replacing um, legacy phone system to a newer phone system. So uh, I can tell you, it's either VoIP or unified communication or um, either hard phone, hardware phone on the desk or soft phone. There's plenty of way to make sure that you can that will suit your needs. Um, so now that we have the basic to uh, troubleshoot, they probably could uh, set it up by themselves. By yes. Themselves. <laughs> yes. And Google's your friend. Put those error codes in Google. I still do that, even though as long as I've been doing it, there's always something I'm overlooking. So put those error codes in Google. That <laughs> you'll land on a result. You land in one of the forums. I, I love when I land on the uh, VoIP MS wiki because you guys have a lot of things documented too. <laughs> It's a it's because it's became a name at WordMS that our wiki are used by our competitor. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's really <laughs> honestly uh, uh, we 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 know that our competitor we are using. Uh, they 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 just wait that we put the info in our wiki so they can use it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, this has been great. Hopefully it helps some people uh, get, get started on troubleshooting voice. <laughs> yes, exactly. I um, was really pleased to have you uh, on this video today. Uh, I hope we will have to, to uh, we will have the chance to discuss other topics yes. uh, in the near futures. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, we will have the chance to meet each other at some point. Uh, I think yes. you are a hot sauce lover and uh, yes. I can't wait to do uh <laughs> a, a dipping competition uh, with yes you, uh, with, uh, I'm, yeah if you're ever in detroit if you're ever near the detroit area just stop on by so <laughs> I'll do this all right thank you have a nice day